The term unconscious bias has become a staple within diversity and inclusion initiatives, but what actually is the science behind it and how does it really impact us as a society? Offering a new perspective focused on the neuroscience behind unconscious bias is behavioural and data scientist Pragya Agarwal. Pragya is the author of Sway, Unraveling Unconscious Bias, and was named as one of the 100 most influential women in social enterprise in the UK. She's appeared on several international podcasts, radio and television channels, and has her own podcast called Outside the Boxes. Please welcome Pragya Agarwal. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Victoria. Lovely to be here. Now, the term unconscious bias is often thrown around as, as something of a buzzword, really, these days. Um, as a behavioural scientist and a neuroscientist, what does it actually mean? What is unconscious bias? Yeah, simply speaking, unconscious bias are just the biases or prejudices or shortcuts in our brain that we fall back on without realising or without acknowledging that they are there. So um, we might have a preference for something or we might have a generalised assumption about certain people and situations. And we use that shortcut that's pre-existing in our brain to make decisions or to interact with people um, in new situations because we don't have time to rationalize every bit of information that's coming at us. Because we are not consciously aware that this is happening, these are called unconscious biases. Also, because in the current climate or recently, people are less likely to admit to any kind of conscious prejudices and biases. And we all assume that we are very fair minded and we are egalitarian, but we all carry these kind of biases and prejudices and stereotypes in our brains based on our experiences, our memories, our upbringing, our context. And we don't often realize that or even acknowledge that or are aware of it. So these are, simply speaking, this is called unconscious bias. And these unconscious biases can obviously have uh, lots of negative impacts. Uh, give us a few examples. What, what's the problem with unconscious bias? What outcomes can that result in? So as I said, unconscious biases are not always negative. We can have positive biases or preferences for certain things. Of course, simply speaking, like if I have an, a preference for a certain flavor of ice cream and I naturally fall back on it and I Otherwise, I'll be spending millions of hours just rationalizing every bit of decision. But when that kind of bias results in a negative discrimination or prejudice against somebody because of a positive bias towards somebody else, for instance, we might be more inclined due to affinity bias to associate, to have an affinity to people who have the same football team, who same, support the same football team. And that in itself is not really a negative bias. But if it results in us discriminating against somebody who does not support a football team, then that has a negative implication. So it has implications in workplaces in terms of hiring and recruitment. If we think that a person who went to the same university, we will have a natural affinity bias towards it. Um, and we might not realize how it's affecting our decisions. We might think that we might are making really objective decisions. But what's happening is that because of this affinity bias, a halo bias is created, which means that we give more weight to any of the positive attributes that they have. Also, it can result in horn effect, which means that, that we are more likely to focus on the negative attributes of the person who we don't have an affinity bias with. So that means that when, even when we consider that we are making really egalitarian or objective decisions, we are unconsciously biased towards somebody who we have affinity bias with. And so there are millions of examples like this, but then it has serious implications in society like sexism, gender um, bias, and also racism as well. There are other biases like age bias and ageism, so that we are bored, we are have certain biases or stereotypes of older people or people of a certain generation, um, and then we use that to make certain decisions. It had, it has really serious implications even in uh, domains such as legal frameworks and in and juries and in medical and healthcare diagnosis to means that we often consider to be very objective and rational. And you talk in your book uh, about the importance of considering intersectional identities. So, you know, it's not as simple as just thinking about sexism or just thinking about racism. How does uh, intersectionality affect how we behave around people? 
Yeah, absolutely. As you say, intersectionality is really important. And I think we do have to consider intersectionality when we are considering biases, but also privileges and the notion of power and the notion of power and hierarchy results in these biases as well. So, for instance, um, when there is an intersection of different identities, that means some of these biases can be either heightened or can be suppressed because of the other identity. So no person has a singular identity. Every person has multiple identities. For instance, a black woman and a black man, they obviously both have that kind of notion of a black person, which can result in the racial bias against them. But because one is a woman and a man, they have different, the intersection of the sex or the gender and the race can result in different sorts of biases against a black man and woman. And we know that how black men or black boys from a very young age are considered threatening or considered aggressive because of the intersection of that identity. For instance, an older woman and an older man have different kinds of biases. And within our society, an older woman faces a different kind of biases and prejudices. And we know that we have several examples of it in real life and research. Um, and in how an older woman is perceived much differently than an older man. So that intersection of the age and also the gender creates a different kind of bias. So I think intersectionality of bias is really important to consider as well. I suppose the first step to uh, making progress on this issue is, you know, becoming more aware of our own unconscious biases. What's the best way to do that, given that, you know, we're not necessarily thinking about them consciously, as you say? Yes, I think um, the first step really is to acknowledge that we are all biased, that we carry biases, because there is a lot of reluctance and defensiveness around it. We debate these terms end endlessly. We do, do try to say that we don't have any biases. We try and think that unconscious biases, people say that unconscious bias is actually dismissing the systemic biases that exist in a society, the systemic inequalities. And what I like to say is that Yes, there is these systemic inequalities, which are created from a historic legacy of oppressions and the way that society has worked. And that results in our individual biases because we learn from these systemic inequalities and we form our notion of hierarchies and biases and stereotypes from the, the way that we are rooted in the society. But our individual biases contribute to the systemic racism or systemic sexism or other kinds of systemic prejudices and perpetuate them even further. So it's a vicious cycle. And I think we have to address both individual and systemic and structural inequalities and biases. And we have to take individual accountability and responsibility. We cannot just say we have to first address the structural uh, issues first. Um, and I think we have to be First of all, we acknowledge that yes, we are all biased. And through this book, I really wanted to say is that, yes, I am biased. I want to acknowledge that, that I might be carrying certain stereotypes, like I talk about the accent bias, which is so popular and so common, the way we assign certain stereotypes, certain accents. Um, and, and because we have these, it affects our decisions uh, unconsciously. But once, once we acknowledge it, then we can start being aware of it and being noticing that what biases we have and and actually unlearning them i really believe that we learn these biases through our our experiences and memories they are we are not born with these biases and through research we know that from developmental psychology that children imbibe some of these biases through the way that they are socialized they, the media parents anything the context around them books so once we learn them we also have the capacity to unlearn these biases. I think kindness and empathy is one of the things. And then stepping into somebody else's shoes metaphorically is also another step where we can actually address some of these biases, where we understand that not there's not just one worldview, there's not just per, one perspective on the world, but there are multiple stories in multiple contexts. And when we start hearing more of these stories and start understanding that there are other perspectives, then we can start taking them into account. As you say, we live in a society that is sort of constantly reinforcing some of these stereotypes we have about people. What is the most effective way to try and counteract your unconscious bias? Um, you know, you acknowledge it, you're trying to be more, more, more aware of it. What, what action can people take to, to really try and improve themselves in that way? Yes, I think we all have a responsibility to um, read more around the subject. I think there is so much up around this. And once we start understanding the science behind the bias, I think what's happening, what's happening in information processing, how are we 
actually deploying some of the shortcuts that exist in our brain? What's happening in our brain? Why do we fall back on these shortcuts? I think that can really be helpful. So for instance, if we understand that there are, is a dual processing theory, there's a system one processing and there's a system two processing, we are bombarded with information from all sides. We cannot process all that information in a rational manner. So we do process some of that information in a very superficial manner where we have to match it. It's kind of a visual matching game. We process any incoming inco information, match it to the existing shortcuts in our brain, which are these stereotypes. And then we are more likely to fall back on these uh, biases. When we are tired and distracted, we're more likely to fall back into our biases. We have to be also consciously aware that when we are relying so much on social media for our news and of our interactions, it can create some of these echo chambers and filter bubbles that we are talking about a lot these days about how we are only hearing one worldview. You're not hearing dissenting worldviews. You're not hearing different world opinions. So what happens is that we only hear our views being echoed back at us. And we just assume that's one perspective on the world. And I think as, as we become conscious and we take time with our decisions, important decisions and interactions, we take time to let the dual system two processing happen, which is when the information is sent to a cortex, a prefrontal cortex, where the different rules can be applied, where different information can be rationalized. Then actually, we are stepping back from making hasty decisions, reacting really quickly, which we often do these days. And what do you make of unconscious bias training? Because I'm sure lots of people watching will have done some form of training on this. Lots of work, workplaces are starting to adopt it. Um, you know, is it effective? What, what's the role of workplaces? What can they do to, to really kind of help their employees be more aware and more active in um, you know, addressing this issue? Yeah, I mean, in the last few months, if just in the last few months, I've given many talks and workshops on unconscious bias. I think, first of all, the problem is the word of your unconscious bias training, because it has a certain underlying assumption that you can train people out of unconscious bias, or you can cure people out of unconscious bias. And I think that's uh, one of the problems or issues with it. That's a myth, because you can't really, we can't just cure people of unconscious bias. We'll always have certain biases, whether we choose to deploy them or not, whether we take care in deploying them, how we unlearn them has to be a consistent, regular process or through a course of time. It cannot happen instantly in a 20 minute, half an hour online training that can often these trainings are um, designed as. Um, sometimes these online questionnaires or online tools that are used, and I've written an article recently about, and also in the book about how some of them use the implicit association theory. And we need to understand, people need to understand a bit more about the IAT and how it is designed. Even the people who designed it admit that it's not used, it's not supposed to be used as a training mechanism. It has certain uh, issues with it at the moment, which they're trying to address. So I think workplaces have to have a very clear goal, um, short terms and long term about why they want to address unconscious biases. Um, what that, would that look like? What would an unbiased workplace look like? Because unless we have very clear goals, we cannot um, address them. We can just tick boxes and saying, yes, everybody's taken an unconscious bias training, but that doesn't really result in any kind of concrete action. It's just a box ticking exercise. And I think that vision has to come from the top. It's, and also not relying on just the minority ethnic people to lead these agendas and to educate people on unconscious bias training, which I see again and again in workplaces that I work with. And I think this has to be, as I said, a regular ongoing process. So when I work with organizations, often I've worked with them like I've given a workshop now. And it's an interactive, non-judgmental space where people can talk about their biases and prejudices in a kind of a non-judgmental way, reflect on them. And then you come back and reassess it in a fortnight or a month or two months later to see what kind of actions have been taken, what kind of improvements have been made. We need to talk more openly about microaggressions, which are more insidious forms of biases and unconscious biases, which we can often be ignored because it becomes part of the workplace culture. And so um, I think <laughs> there's, a, there's a long answer to it. But in short, I think we need to think about what our goals are. The workplaces have to think about what their goals are and whether they can really be achieved in a 20 minute, half an hour, 45 minute online training. 
That's interesting, actually, that you mentioned the implicit association test, because we've got a question from our audience about that. Um, so I'll put that to you now, if that's all right. Um, the question from the audience says, uh, I often run workshops on unconscious bias, and we talk about the implicit association test as a way of identifying some biases. I'd love to know your opinions on the validity and usefulness of this tool for measuring unconscious bias. So yeah, what, what do you make of it? So yes. Um, I've written um, quite at length in the book, but also there's an article in New Scientist, which I wrote recently about implicit association tests, where I talk to the people who developed it. So there's a specific context to it. And it relates to the association that we make very quickly between con concepts. So if I say red, if I say apple, would you choose red or green? So that kind of quick association you have to make. And that also depends on the context, that also depends on the mood we are in, that also depends on how many times we've already taken the test and we've become familiar with the interface. So the results can also change. That is what research has shown uh, for the same person taking the same test. So it, it can give you an indication of what kind of concepts you affiliate or associate with, but that's not a kind of a, um, a marker for what kind of biases people really carry because that's one snapshot in time it's not how whether somebody's really sexist or racist or not it cannot really prove anything so that is my view on um, the implicit association test it's, it's good as an exercise but i don't personally feel it should be in its current state or design can be used as a training exercise in Great. One more question from our viewers for you, Pragya. How do you think employers and organizations can create a space where employees feel comfortable addressing their bias? And how do you think employees can call out their colleagues' biases in a conducive way? It's quite a tough thing to do, isn't it, calling someone else out? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a huge question. And um, I think, as I said, the vision has to come from the top. It has to come from the leadership. When the leaders or the board um, is actually actively demonstrating that they are engaging with their biases as well. They are ready to talk about their biases and prejudices in a platform where people are not being judged with, without any fear of consequence, right? I think that is what people are really worried about, that whether there's going to be any consequence on the, on the promotion or on the employability, whatever. So I think when that vision comes from the top um, and they take active steps in countering for instance, racism or sexism within the workplace by making really active um, gestures or active actions rather than saying we are going to counter that, we are going to become an inclusive and diverse space. But what does an inclusive workplace look for you? I think they have to first define that really, really clearly. Um, and once that's done that, I think calling out is quite tough. So there has to be a mechanism put in place again from the leadership about how somebody can call out because who do you go to if you have a complaint? What do you do? Because it's not easy to say, you just said this to me. I don't really like it. Again, I think the culture, workplace culture has to change where the focus has to be initially on the impact of an action. And I say this again and again, because often a lot of defensiveness and awkwardness around this kind of um, discussions come from because people are focusing so much on the intent and people can defend it saying my intent wasn't that or my intent wasn't malicious or not i'm not biased or prejudiced i've got lots of friends or minority ethnic friends but i think if you focus on the impact it has had on the person opposite it might be a joke in your view but if it is a microaggression to the other person then that's worth considering so i think that's how we can sometimes call it out as well by focusing on the impact rather than the intent of the person as well saying this is how it made me feel Let's talk about that. Some great advice to end on. Thank you so much for joining us, Pragya. Thank you so much, Ophelia.